Hi, it's good to meet you. Um, I'm sure I've talked to a few of you at least uh, over the phone uh, or, or you've, you've heard me at other times. So I hope I've got something new for you today. I, I was given the brief of preconception planning and diabetes, but I, I couldn't help myself in terms of just doing diabetes. So I've, I've picked, out, picked the eyes out of a few things that I think might be in, of interest to you. And we'll, we'll go through it. If it is uninteresting, please hurry me along. So despite having widely available contraceptives uh, in Australia and, and essentially in most parts of the, the, the world, it's estimated that almost half the pregnancies are still unplanned. So the concept of having someone who has problems with spontaneous conception who presents for assisted fertility gives us an amazing opportunity to, to see these women diagnose and optimise any comorbidities and also potentially have a really big impact on their pregnancy outcomes and potentially their offspring outcomes long term. I think management of the, the preconception period and the postconception or the, the interconception period until their next pregnancy is almost or, or just as important as management of the pregnancy itself. So when they turn up for their preconception counselling to you or to the assistive fertility for, for these guys, then there's an opportunity to, to look at this incredibly high risk, well not incredibly, high risk population to see what we can do. Now the pregnancies of women who've undergone assisted fertility are more high risk. They're more complicated than spontaneous pregnancies. And this is a complex table. I don't necessarily need you to see very much of this table, but what I need you to see is there are a lot of complications. And essentially, when you look at the relative risk, they are increased in this particular population. And I'm going to talk specifically about a few of those. Now, why are they so high risk? What is it about this population that makes them more likely for these potential complications? So there's all the associated uh, complications of the techniques and also uh, complications of assisted fertility that I'm not going to concentrate on, like retrieval of eggs and the anaesthesia and your things like your ovarian hyperstimulation, multiple gestation. And for what I'm going to talk about today, I'm actually going to look at the reasons for their subfertility and how that might reflect other medical issues. Um, we have to think about things, obviously maternal age is a big factor in subfertility, but the ones I'm interested in is often their medical conditions like their polycystic ovarian syndrome, diabetes, obesity, thyroid dysfunction that may be contributing. But also these older women with these comorbidities are far more likely to have other comorbidities like hypertension, etc., that will complicate their pregnancy. So you start seeing things like subfertility as a proxy for a comorbid mother, and certainly as a physician, that's, that's mainly what I see. But also that the uh, women using IVF are, are, are predisposed to other medical complications that are going to complicate their pregnancy. So I see, sorry, I'm flicking through these. So I see these women as a, as a targeted audience for preconception counselling, and you've got this captive, high-risk audience. So what I'd like to talk about is just some musings around some of these conditions and how you might be able to optimise them preconception. And I picked these because I think they're a bit more likely in these women presenting with subfertility or women presenting for some kind of assistance in fertility. I'm highly aware it can be a very complex assessment, that there are lots of intricacies and nuances to it. And I'm going to take a brief moment to put in a plug that we're happy to see these women Anyone who you think might be high risk or you'd like an assessment to see if there's a way of optimising their medical condition, really happy to see them at Nambour Hospital if you refer them up. And I, as we expand our service, we'll actually be looking to have, hopefully this year, later this year and certainly from next year, a preconception dedicated clinic. And what we'd be looking to do is create a, pre a preconception plan and then hand them back to you with a view that if you wanted to send them back when they were pregnant, we'd be delighted to see them again. So I, I will start with advanced maternal age. And I remember the very first time I turned up to my obstetrician, the, one of the first things on the problem list was advanced maternal age, and I, I was devastated. Um, but it's really common, and, and it's, it's increasingly common, and that, that that's why they're presenting to you and subsequently to fertility <coughs> solutions. But for me, it means they're more likely to have pre-existing comorbidities and things like your hypertension, diabetes, increased BMI, and, and increasingly things like cardiovascular disease, which we didn't usually used to think about. It's also a risk factor for almost all pregnancy and perinatal complications, independent of all of those things, anywhere from things like C-section, obstetric haemorrhage, but also your hypertensive disorders and your gestational diabetes. Looking specifically at, uh, at PCOS, it's common. 
I didn't quite get my head around that it's one in five women that they quote, up to one in five women of childbearing age in Australia can have PCOS. And it's often it has other associated features uh, like your obesity and your impaired glucose metabolism and insulin resistance, etc. I guess one that I think potentially might be slightly underdone is it's got a higher risk of mental health and uh, psychosocial issues. Uh, and I know personally I've probably underdone that in times past. They've got a high risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. And, and this just as high as gestational diabetes, up to three times risk. Preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, up to three and a half times risk. They also have that long-term risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So when I see these guys preconception, there's a, a range of things that I talk about, and I'm, I'm highly aware that when I'm talking about weight management, I'll do that a little bit here. I'm not giving you any of the, the, the tools that I use. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be nice to lose weight? But I'm happy to talk more about that when we've got a bit more time. So the language around all the guidelines talk about support and education for a healthy lifestyle. But you're looking for a gentle loss with something sustainable. And again, you must do this all the time, so I'm not going to harp on about it. But that 5 to 10% of total body weight loss may have a significant impact on their ovulation and pregnancy outcomes. Obviously, glucose intolerance with an OGTT. Assessing your insulin resistance uh, with your fasting insulin. And George is going to talk a little bit more about interventions on, on that front, like metformin. Assessing their cardiovascular risk and cardiovascular risk factors. And also looking at their medications for pregnancy. It's probably a bit silly to point out your antiandrogens and those kind of things need to stop before you fall pregnant. I've mentioned a prenatal vitamin. There is, oh actually I'll talk about that a little bit later. Because I'm going to talk about obesity next. Now independent of everything else, obesity itself is a risk factor. And it's just a modifiable risk factor that we should be addressing as a separate thing, preconception. It's clear evidence that it has an impact on adverse pregnancy outcomes, but increasingly we're aware that a pre-pregnancy BMI has a significant impact on the offspring's long-term risk of type 2 diabetes and obesity, independent of their, their genetic risks that they inherit from their parents. When I see these ladies, obviously weight is the first thing to talk about. And we know that if you can lose weight, higher risk of spon uh, higher chance, sorry, of spontaneous ovulation, pregnancy rate, fertility therapy uh, response, and reduced miscarriage rate. So it should be as simple as putting everyone on a bit of a very low energy diet for six months and, and losing a whole lot of weight by, by rights. But it's not quite that simple. And there's certainly been animal studies uh, that have suggested that a precipitous weight loss with a ketogenic diet prior to conception has poorer pregnancy outcomes with things like miscarriages and a ketogenic diet in, in pregnancy, and this is for weight loss, um, actually does have animal studies, potential risks of, for fetal development. There aren't many good uh, uh, human studies that I'm aware of, but I'm sure they're coming. And this is, this is the very low energy, no carbohydrate type diets I'm talking about. So you're looking at this gentle weight loss, looking at that 5 to 10% total body weight loss with a sustainable diet and exercise program and preferably being a bit stable for that six months prior to pregnancy or conception, I'm sorry. So I've talked a bit about weight. I do look at their glucose tolerance uh, test prior to conception if I, if I can. I like doing a urine uh, protein creatinine ratio as a baseline and that, that's useful for me for a couple of reasons. Women who are obese do have a higher risk of proteinuria. It's helpful for me to help clarify their, their preeclampsia risk. And it's also really helpful when I do look to diagnose preeclampsia later on. It's very helpful for me to know whether their proteinuria is new or old because uh, that may, means it's either helpful or not helpful in making that diagnosis. Cardiovascular risks, and then looking at their medications for pregnancy. I've mentioned prenatal vitamin here, actually, because there is uh, some murmurings that whether there, there should be a role for, for high-dose folic acid, 5 milligrams daily folic acid, certainly in pregnancy, because women who are obese have an up to 1.8 odds ratio, or relative risk, sorry, 1.8 times risk of uh, things like neural tube defects, among other congenital abnormalities. Now, when they are pregnant, it's really important. Weight kind of went out for a period of time to do it every, uh, every clinic visit, but it's, it's coming back in, and it's actually been recognised as a very important thing to do, particularly targeting appropriate gestational weight gain. I'll, I'll mention that a little bit uh, later. 
and that's your dietary advice should be ongoing, your exercise recommendations. I've mentioned psychotherapy again. There's some evidence to suggest that women, and particularly the super obese women with BMIs over 40, have a far higher uh, history or report a far higher history of, of abuse in times past and a far higher history of mental health issues. So it's just important to recognise, and again, that's something I don't think I've recognised and, and managed as well as I could, but I will from time forward. An early glucose test. I would probably do it at presentation if, it, uh, if, if I could, and again, repeat it if it was normal later in the pregnancy. I've mentioned anomaly screening, and I, I will say it's nice to think about a, a scan in a, an experienced place, both because of the technical difficulties, but they do have a, a much higher rate of, uh, uh, of congenital... Much higher. They do have an increased rate of congenital abnormalities associated with just being obese alone. I treat them as a high-risk model of care, anaesthetic consultation, and I also have mentioned briefly aspirin and VT prophylaxis, which is very nuanced in terms of other risks and, and determining a lady's risk versus benefit, but they are considerations in the obese women. Now, none of this is evidence-based, it's all expert opinion-based, but there is reasonable data to, to support these interventions uh, as driven by the increased risk. Gestational weight gain, it, it's really important uh, if you can limit gestational weight gain in the obese women, you may find that you'll have a, a, a drop in risk. And there was a study that looked at a, a large number of women that had weight gain of less than 8 kilos, and that reduced their risk of preeclampsia, <coughs> sections, large for gestational age babies. But it did increase their risk of small for gestational age babies. And the recommended gain in pregnancy is, is to very dependent on what your pre-pregnancy BMI is. And I'm sure you've all seen this chart. So depending on what your pre-pregnancy BMI is, if you're underweight, they're quite keen for you to gain anywhere between about 12 and 18 kilos. So gaining less than that is a little concern and needs to, to be addressed to see if there's a reason. Gaining more than that is a concern. And it works out at about 0.5 kilos a, a week. In the second and third trimester, there shouldn't be a gain in the first trimester. Normal weight, anywhere between 11 to 16 kilos, just under a kilo uh, per week in the, the second and third trimester. Once you start becoming overweight and obese, it's a far lesser gain uh, for the whole pregnancy and uh, for the second and third trimester weekly gain. And I've seen some lovely presentations uh, more recently, because these were done, I think, in 2014, some lovely presentations for people saying the super obese, you probably shouldn't gain any weight at all. Uh, but that's not yet part of the recommendations. I use regular weight tracker charts, and they're a lovely visual guide where you can point to women where they are and say, look, this is where we're up to. We're probably getting outside of where we need to be. You know, let's address your diet. Let's see where we can change things and do it in a healthy way. But it can be a nice way of, uh, of addressing weight in the appropriate language that is not confrontator and, and get women to, to engage with you about uh, looking at their diet. Talking a little bit about diabetes, finally we get to the diabetes part. I don't need to tell you that uh, hyperglycemia in pregnancy has significant impact on outcomes, both maternal short-term, long-term, but also fetal short and newborn short-term and long-term. I'm pretty sure you know most of these, so I won't uh, harp on about it. Diabetes is a big spectrum. I've mentioned pre-diabetes here, the impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, because these are high-risk women. And obviously, you've then got your pre-existing diabetes, type 1, type 2, and the less common ones like your monogenic or MODIs and uh, pancreatic insufficiency, which is rare. And then we've got our largest group, an increasing, ever-increasing group of gestational diabetics. Briefly talking about pre-diabetes, uh, pre it is really good to recognise and treat so you have to start thinking about screening these women and I would personally consider screening all women who come with maternal factor subfertility but I'd probably be a little bit more guided or stratify their risk a little bit about the other risk factor profile. And some of the things that, that, that identify people as high risk uh, for GDM, saying please do an early OGTT, are actually quite good for the women preconception as well. So the obvious ones, the ethnicity, the older women, if they've had previous uh, uh, glucose intolerance of some sort or have a family history, and obesity, PCOS, etc. All of these are good indications to say they help to stratify your risk and make sure that you're screening these women preconception. But now I'm just going to concentrate on the type 1s and type 2s. 
it's really important, oh, again, I don't need to tell this group, uh, but it's really important to discuss planning for pregnancy in any woman of childbearing age who has diabetes. I, I do it up front the first time I, I meet women of childbearing age. Uh, I usually address it at some point in their, in their uh, uh, assessment. It works. There's some lovely studies to say that women who attend preconce or have preconception counselling who then go on to get pregnant have a far reduced risk of congenital abnormalities. And in this particular study, they actually reduced it by 60 to 70%. And it went from an absolute risk of 6.5 down to 2.1, which is quite dramatic when we're talking about a, a lifelong potential issue for your offspring. <laughs> Even if they're not actively planning to fall pregnant, I have the conversation and I also discuss contraception and I scare the blazers out of all my young adults. I come on a Tuesday, I come directly from my high-risk antenatal clinic to my young adult clinic and I sit down, I've got it right in the forefront that they need to be planning pregnancy and I get these little sort of bright-eyed 18-year-olds around going, right, are we getting pregnant? They're doing the con And it's a lovely opportunity to go, right, contraception, how are we going to address this? Because uh, I think it's something they need to know about. And let them know that planning works very well. Unplanned, it can be a bit tricky. <coughs> if they are planning a pregnancy, the things that with pre-existing diabetes, controls paramount if you can. They need to be taking blood sugars. And to be honest, in some people, that's, that's half the battle. It's just to get some blood sugar so you know what's going on. As close as possible to 6% is where you're aiming for your A1C. Under 6.5 is, 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 is a good place to aim. And then it's the complication review, and these can cause real trouble in pregnancy. So if you can get someone, it's nice to check their eyes, because any pre-existing retinopathy has a potential to take off dramatically in pregnancy. So to diagnose it and treat it preconception, you can save someone's eyesight potentially. Kidneys, you double your GFR in pregnancy, so any underlying renal disease will be magnified in pregnancy. And it's nice to ass assess their, their proteinuria because, again, it helps to clarify their preeclampsia risk and whether they should be on prophylaxis to reduce that risk of preeclampsia. Uh, autoimmune stuff, yes, TSH, your celiac screen, because they do have an impact and are easily modifiable. Important to think of autonomic stuff like your gastroparesis. And lastly, macrovascular. Again, we don't tend to think about it in young women, but I've had at least one, admittedly, <coughs> smoking, poorly controlled, long-standing type, uh, type 1 diabetic lady who had chest pain and a troponin leak in her uh, delivery and went on to have the workup and her triple bypass in the postpartum period. So it's not unheard of. It may, makes, makes it a bit tricky for them. So just thinking about it and, and looking at their risk. All the guidelines say folic acid, high dose, daily, and preferably, again, starting preconception and, and travelling through for the first trimester. It's good to look at their medication. So for those on a basal bolus regimen, I really like to give them the most flexibility with their dosing. And, and if you think they're up to it, carb counting, correction dosing is, is a great way of going about things. I can talk about that to, to anyone who'd like to, who's interested. There, there are lots of things that you can use to help guide that in terms of getting them to use special meters and, and uh, lots of apps on the phone, things like that, that, that might be helpful to, to drive them down that path because it does give them a far greater flexibility in dosing. Uh, I haven't talked about pumps at all, but again, happy to talk about that at any point. Type 2s, oral hypoglycemics, metformin is the only one that people are comfortable with in pregnancy uh, and has, has reasonable safety data. Um, so that's the only one to continue on. So you need to modify that in women who are looking to fall pregnant, whether you change them from their multiple oral hypoglycemic regimen to metformin plus insulin if required. First up is what I, I aim to do when people are actively trying so you can stabilise things on their insulin. Uh, but some people will run them through and change that over when they're first uh, diagnosed as pregnant. I, I still worry that you miss a bit of time on oral hypoglycemics in that very first part of pregnancy that may or may not have safety data. Obviously, cease the bad stuff, the ACEs, the A2s, the statins and fibrates, and replace the antihypertensives if required. Uh, and it kind of depends why they're on an ACE and A2. It might be for proteinuria, it might be for, for that and blood pressure, but it's nice to address that. And the other thing is I always consider whether my type 1s should be on prophylaxis. And there's lovely data to suggest that aspirin, 100 milligrams daily, and, and calcium, preferably about four serves of uh, dietary calcium, but failing that uh, supplementary calcium, will reduce you, your risk of preeclampsia. And lastly, love to be involved. If you see these ladies, and you, particularly with the type 1, type 2, they, they do tend to be high risk, so if you can 
uh, if, if you're interested, we'd love to see them because often they're, they're a bit high risk and we end up catching up with them anyway and it's nice to do that earlier rather than later. And also you have the opportunity to assess alcohol and cigarettes and things. I like to manage their expectations in pregnancy as well. I, I talk about potential risks in pregnancy and the potential risk of congenital abnormalities, their potential risk of hypertensive disorders, preterm delivery, etc. Some of the nuts and bolts in the first trimester they will have wobbly blood sugars. And part of that's driven by nausea and vomiting, but not all of it. They do lose hypoglycemic awareness, and that's quite important because people who are used to getting their hypo symptoms at four and, and, are, and are very safe lose that, and suddenly they get to a blood sugar of two without realising that they're there, and it can be a bit scary for them, and it can be dangerous for them and us. Uh, I get them to be aware of it, particularly when they're driving and take their blood sugar before they hop behind the wheel of a car, you know, the over five to drive. Uh, second trimester, it is a time of relative stability, but it is nice to say that I'd like you to have a morphology scan, preferably in the experienced centre, if, particularly if they've had poor control at conception or in the first trimester. It's nice to have another look at their eyes at around 28 weeks because anything that has taken off will be diagnosable at that point. And third trimester, they're going to have markedly increasing insulin requirements. It sounds silly to point out, but if you've got a very insulin sensitive type one, they get really anxious when they see their, blood, their, their insulin requirements creeping up and they, they're often reluctant to push because they think there's a problem rather than realizing it's just a natural part of pregnancy. They'll often have growth scans. We do watch them carefully for preeclampsia and often have a planned delivery. I'm briefly talking about thyroid dysfunction, only briefly, but again, if anyone has any questions, happy to address them. It's got a profound effect on thyroid, both the, the structure and the, the function, uh, and it is associated with an increased pregnancy risk. It's really well recognised that overt hypothyroidism does have problems with baby's development and particularly neurocognitive development and does have an increased risk of pregnancy complications. Probably less well defined at this stage is your subclinical. And it, it possibly does have increased neurocognitive deficits, although the, the, the data is still reasonably conflicting. There were some early studies that suggested quite a significant impact, later studies that, uh, again, have quite conflicting data. Still, still recommended to, to chase it, though. There are pregnancy complications, and, and another one that uh, you may have heard me talk about before, but there's been at least uh, uh, two studies by an Italian group that found women who had a TSH in their first trimester over 2.5 had an increased risk of miscarriage and preterm delivery. And they took a subgroup who had positive antibodies, so positive TPO antibodies, and they treated them with thyroxine, and that risk fell back to baseline. Uh, again, there are studies ongoing to, to back that up, but it is still something that does drive some of our treatment. <laughs> interpreting TFTs can be... Uh, you, you need to be a bit careful about interpreting them in pregnancy. So TSH is the most reliable part of the, the full TFT profile. It's recently been accepted the upper limit of normal of TSH in pregnancy should be 2.5 to 3, depending on your trimester, not the 4 or the 4 plus that you see in the non-pregnant reference range. So that, if you, every lab will have their own reference range, but in, a, in absence of that, you can use this as a rule of thumb that 2.5 first trimester, 3 for the second and third trimester is probably the reference range that we should be using and has been recommended by uh, most of the big thyroid bodies. The free T3 and free T4, the assay is, is uh, for, free, for the T4, T3, it's, it's well recognised total T4 and total T3 uh, are not so much affected, but the, the free T4, free T3, the, the, I, I gather the assay is very affected by uh, changes in protein binding and, and in pregnancy that is a significant issue. So they're not as reliable. So do them, they are useful but TSH is the most interpretable one of all TFTs and that's what should drive your changes in, in medication. So if you're on thyroxine, and this is the only group I've addressed for preconception counselling, if you're on thyroxine, aim for a preconception TSH under 2.5 for a couple of reasons. Higher than 2.5, there has been association with increased risk of miscarriage and preterm delivery. If you've got a, an upper... Uh, treatment range TSH, meaning in the lower half of the range. It also means your chance of becoming hypothyroid if you don't change your dose is smaller. Around well, 50 to 80 percent of women, the majority of women will require more thyroxine in pregnancy uh, to maintain their euthyroid status. So I make a plan with all of my childbearing years, 
ladies on thyroxine, what they are going to do if they find they're pregnant and that they, I tell them they will need increased uh, a thyroxine in pregnancy. So at least they know and they don't turn up on your doorstep uh, with, with a, a TSH of 80 or something. It, it's something that can be well managed preemptively. Uh, even if they're not planning pregnancy, if they're aware they need to go and see someone as soon as they find out they're pregnant uh, to address their thyroxine, that's also useful. I increase their dose by, well, the guidelines suggest increasing their dose by 30%. And the rule of thumb, that's about an extra two tablets a week. As soon as they get a positive urine test, they should do that. And then they should call you guys or me uh, to, to do some follow-up thyroid function tests aiming at that uh, trimester-specific reference range. Now, how often you do your thyroid function tests? Look, the American Thyroid Association says you should do them every four weeks for the first half of pregnancy, which sounds like a lot to me. But I think doing them regularly, so every time at diagnosis of pregnancy, if you make any dose changes, it should be four to six weeks later. And when you have relative stability in that first or second trimester, you can extend it a little. And you should be doing it at least once a trimester in the second and third trimester. And when they have their baby, you'll need to reduce their uh, thyroxine back to uh, their preconception dose. Lastly, I was going to address hypertension. It's about 5% of pregnancies will be complicated by pre-existing hypertension. Now, the vast majority are essential, but there is a small proportion that have secondary causes, uh, including all of those things. So I have a very skewed view of how I think hypertension runs because I only see the second parts mostly in my endocrine clinics. Uh, but it is something to think about if you've got someone very young who is diagnosed with hypertension in the absence of a very strong family history. Uh, now, it's important to know that you, there's a physiological fall in blood pressure. So first and second trimester, you'll find it decreasing. So you may find you need to reduce your, your medication uh, in that time. But it tends to come back up late second and third trimester. And in women who have uh, back to normal, so in women who have pre-existing hypertension, that's often when we start running into trouble. It's, it's a risk factor, needless to say. If you have pre-existing hypertension entering pregnancy, you've got around a 20% risk of, of preeclampsia of which a significant proportion are, are, is quite severe and, and with an onset before 34 weeks. It is a risk for, and it, it, <coughs> depending on whether you've got preeclampsia superimposed or not, you have a differing risk of when you deliver and how preterm your delivery is. But it's got an increased risk of things like caesarean section, small for gestational age and, and a low birth weight among other things. So with my hypertension women, and this is just a, a brief nutshell, I do consider whether we screen them for secondary causes. It's nice to do a urine uh, um, microscopy culture, etc. cetera, um, just looking for, for active sediment. Uh, and it's also nice to do a protein creatinine ratio. Again, it might diagnose a renal cause it, uh, and, and, and allow that to be addressed. It is useful to uh, assess uh, preeclampsia risk. And it is also useful for later on when I, I'm thinking about diagnosing preeclampsia. And I know that that proteinuria is either use, new or has been there all the way through. So it becomes useful or not useful to, to make that diagnosis. It's also nice to think about end organ damage. So do they need to address their left ventricular hypertrophy, etc.? It's good to optimise medications, and the old school ones are the safe ones, as you know. Labetalol, methyl dopa and nifedipine tend to be our relative first line, but there are other agents. And also think about whether you give them that aspirin, calcium, etc., for preeclampsia prophylaxis. So, in summary, these women are often a high-risk group. They often have multiple comorbidities that may or may not be diagnosed, and we have this amazing opportunity to diagnose them, treat them, and make a real difference to their, their pregnancy and also their subsequent pregnancies, also their baby's offspring, uh, their offspring's outcome in the future. As I said, we are expanding our service. That will be happening from, from now and certainly next year, but we're building up the service now. If you have people you have a, are worried about or are thinking about pregnancy or even not thinking about pregnancy now but in the future and just want a periconception plan about what would be a good way of having these women optimised, we're really happy to see them. Um, uh, uh, if you have someone very acute and you need them to be seen ASAP, I can give you the phone number for our little decked phone, which is, I don't know if you've got a pen, but it's, uh, it's the, the usual thing, the 5470, but the, the second part, 5734, um, or just ring up and ask the switchboard and ask to talk to the obstetric physician on. Um, that is still a business hours, but we're looking to do after hours as well. And uh, hopefully we can give you some advice or at least take uh, uh, the name and, and see if we can pop them in earlier rather than later.